Archbishop Cushley, as part of his desire both to serve and to help renew our archdiocese, is asking us to turn to the Lord through a traditional and beautiful Catholic devotion called the 40 Hours. This will be a privileged time of Eucharistic adoration in each parish. By spending time in silence before the Lord, we draw down the blessing of God into our families, our parishes, and our local church. How can we prepare for this, though, so that each of us can encounter Jesus and know his personal love? Part of our job on the Catechetics Commission is to help you do just that. At the heart of the 40 hours is that mystery of our faith, which we call the real presence. That is, the faith of the Church that in the Eucharist, what looks like bread and wine, is actually the living presence of Jesus Christ. As we rediscover the 40 hours devotion, then, it seems good to talk a little bit about the real presence. So this first session is going to concentrate on Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, the Eucharist. What is this mysterious presence, and why do we believe it? We want, in an accessible way, to offer you some ways of thinking about the Eucharist, some tools, if you like, that we hope will help you to enter more deeply into this mystery. That way, you can participate fruitfully in the 40 Hours Devotion when it takes place in your parish. Let's start by talking about the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist in terms of friendship and relationship. What I'd like to suggest is that if you understand the shape of our relationship with Jesus, while it is surprising, even startling, that he comes to us as food, in a sense, it's not that out of character. Jesus is forever doing things that we silly, vain, and proud human beings wouldn't expect him to do. Very often when we stand outside of a relationship, we don't understand the relationship. For example, I have a friend who is a football fan. I won't tell you what team he supports. But for the sake of argument, let's call him Jim. Now, I am not a football fan. I can see how you might enjoy playing football yourself, but I can't see how watching other people play a game that you don't get to join in with could possibly be pleasurable. And I certainly don't understand how the question of whether one set of players or another wins that game that you are not playing could possibly determine your mood. But my friend Jim, when his team, team loses, is inconsolable. The point I'm trying to make is this. Jim has a relationship with his team, with the whole world of football, if you like. I don't. And because I stand coldly outside of that relationship, I don't get it. And the shape, the internal dynamic of that relationship appears to me to be incomprehensible because it's not mine. But that doesn't mean I'm right. Because that relationship is real, and it means a great deal to Jim. I just stand outside of it. In the person of Jesus Christ, because he is truly God and truly man, we human beings are invited into a relationship of friendship with Almighty God. If we choose to stand coldly outside of the friendship that is offered to us, it is possible that the internal dynamic of that friendship might appear to us absurd. If, on the contrary, we enter into that friendship, then we begin to discern the contours of that friendship. 
And the more deeply we enter into that friendship, the more clearly we perceive its shape. Because Jesus is always, for want of a better word, disappearing before us in the helpless child in Bethlehem who was laid in the manger, which is where the animals would have come to eat. The majesty and the immensity of God presents itself to us as tiny and defenseless. And then we talk about the 30 years of the hidden life of our Lord. And they are exactly that, hidden. You can, of course, multiply examples. But one that moves me every time I read it is when Jesus is presented with the woman caught in adultery. And so you remember the episode. She is caught and brought before Jesus. And he says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he bends down and starts writing in the sand. That he bends down is a a subtle detail, but it is important, I think. And as he writes in the sand, everyone starts to leave. And then we are told, and I quote, Jesus was left alone with the woman who was standing there. And Jesus, who at this point is below the woman, crouched, writing, well, then the gospel says, he looked up and he refuses to condemn her. The justice of almighty God, which has power over us sinners in Jesus, gets down on its knees in front of us. And when you start to get that, well, well, it's just breathtaking. And then, of course, in the absolute weakness of the cross, Jesus triumphs and brings the whole cosmos back to God. And so when you begin to grasp the internal dynamic of how Jesus establishes his offer of friendship to us. His majesty is constantly hidden, disappears, becomes small before us. And if you think about the Eucharist in this context, though you could never predict it, it just somehow seems in keeping that this Jesus would come to us here and now under the humble appearances of that which gives us strength and life, under the appearances of food, under the appearances of bread. The Eucharistic presence of Jesus with us, with his church, is so vital that the church really couldn't exist without the Eucharist. And we stand on this faith only because we believe it came from the Lord's own mouth. When you look at the Gospels, we see that Jesus all over the place saying things that change the course of events. There are miracles where he heals just by speaking, like the servant of the centurion. He says to the centurion, go, be it done for you as you have believed. And the man's servant was healed instantaneously without Jesus ever even setting eyes on him. Jesus also calms nature just by a word. He speaks to the sea like he knows it and he has known it forever. In Mark's gospel, for example, when the apostles come to him frantic at their peril because they're in this terrible storm on the sea, they wake him up 
And he stands up and rebukes the wind and says to the sea, peace, be still. But in Greek, the literal translation of that word is be muzzled. In other words, put a lid on it. So who talks to the sea this way? He has complete authority to command nature itself. He also commands the demons. They go where he says, when he says. In all these instances, we see that Jesus speaks with power and his words change things. It might seem strange that he changed the bread and wine into his body and blood, but clearly he had the power to do this. It's been a part of the apostolic preaching from the very beginning, in fact, that he did just that, that he changed bread and wine into his body and blood. In St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, which we can date to the middle of the first century, Paul reminds them of what he taught them about the Eucharist while he was present among them preaching. I mean, that's a fascinating thought, isn't it? We know that Paul was in Corinth around 51 AD, And in his letter, he points to his time with them. And he says, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. St. Paul then goes on, interestingly, to warn the Corinthians not to eat or drink the Eucharist unworthily. Now, if this were normal bread and wine, that wouldn't make sense. If nothing happened when Jesus spoke those words at the Last Supper, Why would it matter if you were not prepared to eat it? Who cares? But something did happen. And it's not just like any other food. There's another important passage that we need to look at, where Jesus teaches his disciples in an uncompromising way about the reality of the Eucharist. And that is John chapter 6. Father Andrew Garden is going to help us think about this. I'd like to speak about the beautiful words of Jesus that we find in chapter 6 of John's Gospel, those words where Jesus speaks of himself as the bread of life, the bread which has come down from heaven, given for the life of the world. We find these words of Jesus after the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, the miracle of Jesus walking on the water. Jesus speaks these profound and beautiful words, words that are filled with light and filled with truth. Sometimes we maybe wish that our faith in the Eucharist were more living, were deeper, were stronger. These words of Jesus are given to us precisely for that reason, to deepen and to strengthen our faith in the Eucharist. Jesus speaks of the bread of God, the bread which has come down from heaven. Jesus speaks of his flesh and blood. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life in him. Listen to these words of Jesus, and maybe in a time of adoration, this is a time when we can allow these truths really to take root in our hearts and to deepen in our hearts. Jesus speaks of himself as the living bread, the bread of life, the bread which has come down from heaven. But at the same time, Jesus speaks of the reality of his flesh and blood. And Jesus unites those. We find the identity of those. And as we listen to the words of Jesus, speaking of himself as the bread of life, speaking of his flesh and blood, this one heavenly reality given to us, we realize that Jesus is speaking about this mystery of the Eucharist. The words of Jesus that we find in John's Gospel, in chapter 6 of John's Gospel, these words of Jesus are sometimes thought to be very mysterious and very complicated and difficult. In fact, some of the people listening to Jesus say, this is a hard saying. Who can listen 
to this. But I think those who react in this way are maybe listening in the wrong kind of way. Again and again in this passage, Jesus encourages us to listen with faith. Jesus encourages us to believe. Once we begin to listen with faith, we realize that the words of Jesus are not complicated. The words of Jesus have a beautiful clarity about them. Jesus encourages us to believe. This is the work of God, Jesus says, to believe in the one whom he sent. Later on, he says, there are some of you who do not believe. What is it to believe? It's clear in this passage that the usual ways that we have of coming to knowledge of the physical world, using our senses, using our ordinary ways of thinking, don't reach the reality that Jesus is speaking about. We need faith to be able to come to know in this deeper kind of way. But Jesus shows us what that faith is. Jesus says, the words that I have spoken are spirit and they are life. It's using the words of Jesus, it's accepting the words of Jesus that we come to believe and that we come to know in this deeper kind of way. I love the moment in this passage where Jesus says, do you find this difficult? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? This question of Jesus makes it so clear to us that reality is so much richer than what we have access to in our normal ways of knowing. What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? And we realise, yes, my ways of knowing are so limited. As we recognise this, we ask the Lord to give us another way of knowing, a deeper way of knowing. And Jesus gives us that way of knowing by giving us his words. The words that I have spoken are spirit and they are truth. As we listen to Jesus speaking, maybe particularly in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, we come to that knowledge. If what Jesus was saying was complicated and difficult, then it would only be those who are particularly clever who would remain at the end of this passage. We're told of those who stop walking with Jesus because they don't accept the words that he gives them. But then Jesus turns to Peter and to the twelve and he says, what about you? Are you going to go away as well? Are you going to stop going with me? But Peter has the most beautiful answer, Lord, who would we go to? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Again, Peter is speaking of belief and of faith, of accepting the words of Jesus. So when Jesus speaks of himself as the one who has come down from heaven, as the living bread given to us for the life of the world, when Jesus speaks of eating his flesh and drinking his blood, bringing these two beautiful realities together, we know what the Lord is inviting us to do is to accept this truth. What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? I find this question of Jesus may be useful even as we sit in the presence of the, of the Blessed Sacrament and we wonder, how can this be true? The same question that some of those around Jesus ask, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? But when we ask ourselves that question, how can this be true? We allow Jesus in turn to question us. What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? And we realize, yes, our ways of knowing are limited. Reality is so much richer, this heavenly reality that the Lord offers us and that the Lord offers us in the Eucharist. This reality that he wants us to, 
us to come to know more deeply, more profoundly. He wants us to be drawn to this mystery of his living presence in the Eucharist. I am the living bread which has come down from heaven, the food that endures to eternal life. This is the bread of God, which the Son of Man will give. This word we find again and again in this passage, what Jesus gives for us. And it's recognizing this reality, this truth, that we're drawn into the mystery, into the heavenly mystery of the Eucharist, this beautiful mystery of our faith, conceived by God from all eternity, given for the life of the world. Now, one of the important things to remember is that once we've discovered this treasure of the Lord's real presence, it has an impact upon us. We naturally want to respond to it. It has an effect in our lives. Principally, it, I think it has three effects. First of all, it leads us, this friendship that the Lord offers us, leads us to want to pray and be in his presence. Secondly, it leads us to want to share this treasure with others. That's how friendship works. You know, we want our friends to be friends with our friends. And so we want to share the friendship. And I suppose that's, that's what we're trying to do through these presentations. We're trying to share with you that offer of friendship that the Lord, that we have received from the Lord. And thirdly, and very importantly, true friends, real friends, have an impact upon us. You know, they, they, they shape the way we behave and they, they lift us up, and very often they make us better simply by being our friends. And it's the same in that if we respond to that offer of friendship made to us through the real presence of the Lord, it, 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 it changes us, it makes us better, and it makes us want to, in our behavior, reflect that friendship that we have with our Lord. And so we've asked Father Basil Clark, who is one of the priests in the Archdiocese, who has a leadership role uh, in, in the Archdiocese charitable works. We've asked Father Basil to speak about how the real presence of Christ has an impact in our daily lives, through our love and in our bonds with one another. Famously, the Last Supper in St. John's Gospel doesn't mention the institution of the Eucharist. Rather, John focuses on Jesus' action as the master who becomes a servant. Jesus takes on the role of a household slave and washes his disciples' feet. He completes the episode by emphasizing the relationship which is to mark out what communion means. I give you a new commandment, Love one another, you must love one another, just as I have loved you. The vital thing is Jesus' love for us. Love as I have loved you. We are invited to come before the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament as an act of love. If you think about it, 40 hours adoration. Adoration is the language of love, the language of positive, passionate commitment. He adores his wife, she adores her kids. This is not an invitation to sit passively, but an encouragement to actively engage with the Lord by offering him our loving, prayerful attention. Now, this may or may not act on our emotions. Nowadays, we must remind ourselves that love is a deeper, more stable virtue than a fleeting emotional experience. That being said, love should engage the whole of our being. Now, just sometimes, the Lord graciously reaches out to us and demonstrates his real presence. But when he does so, he does it for a purpose. Twice in my life, I've experienced a profound sense of awe before the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Both were moments of conversion. The first was simply an absolute awareness of his presence, which drew from me an overwhelming sense of being loved 
and wanting to love him in return. I wasn't expecting this. The Lord made himself tangible to my sensibilities. All I had done was make myself available to him by being at exposition. The second was in the darkness of depression, and his presence bathed my wounds, reassuring me, even in my emotional pain, that he was there holding me. The master came to me as a servant, as I struggled with faith before the blessed sacrament. Jesus commands his disciples to love by assuring them of his love for them. But how does he love? Well, he loves with his whole self. Jesus embraces his fate and expresses the full extent of his love, when just after he gives the commandment, he goes on to say, a man can have no greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. So, the radical quality of Jesus' command for us to love one another is in the, as I have loved you. At the very least, we are to put others before ourselves. A Our love for one another is to be sacrificial. Impossible, except for the fact he not only gives himself for us, but he also gives himself to us. He shares of his very self in the Eucharist. In this way, he enables what he commands, that we, broken and needy as we are, transformed by his living presence, can love our neighbour as ourselves and one another within the community as he loves us. In this way, we, fed by his holy body, become his body in the world. We who rejoice in his presence become his presence for others. St. Teresa of Avila puts this beautifully. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. In the Eucharist, we who receive his body become his body for the world. Being able to open ourselves to Jesus' love as he is present to us in the Blessed Sacrament brings us to the place where we can begin to make sacrifices for one another, as Father Basil said, an impossible thing without God's grace. But we have been given what we need to truly love, to be Jesus's body in the world. Sometimes our faith in the real presence can seem far away or even non-existent. It can be hard, and many Catholics have lost sight of this faith. They think the Eucharist is a symbol of Jesus, but not really him. In a certain sense, that would be easier, wouldn't it? It's like a token or a photograph to remember him by, right? But no, that's not what Jesus told us. And the church has never strayed from what Jesus said and did at the Last Supper. Perhaps this time of prayer of 40 hours before the Blessed Sacrament seems like a waste of time. Maybe you feel like you're losing your faith. Maybe you've never been taught about the real presence and didn't know that he, Jesus, is here with us. Wherever you are in your faith journey, Jesus is on the other side of that place. Even if you're not there yet, you can't see him, you can't hear him, or your faith in this great mystery has been reduced. Try this gesture of humility that opens you up to him in a very simple way. Try making a true genuflection. When you go into the church, when your time for prayer before the Blessed Sacrament has come, put your right knee all the way down to the ground and intentionally stay there for a moment. You can say to him quietly, my Lord and my God, or Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. If we can open ourselves, even the smallest bit, to his presence, he will not keep himself from us. He's waiting for just that.